I don't know how often that happens, but it doesn't seem to happen that frequently from what I can uh, recall. So before I start talking to you about um, kind of our process in selecting this grant and then a little bit of information about the project that we're funding for them, um, I wanted to kind of set the stage about Uganda itself because considering both of the, pr the programs tonight are in that country, I thought it would be helpful to have some background information. So uh, one of the first things that I wanted to mention, of course, is that uh, Uganda, of course, was under Britain rule. They gained their independence in 1962. Um, historically speaking, for years now, uh, Uganda has been plagued by poor management and corruption. Um, of course, that seems to be a kind of par for the course for many of the countries that we um, fund programs in. Um, an interesting fact about Uganda is that their agriculture employs about 72% of the key workforce, which of course ties in nicely with the program tonight, considering um, a large component of what this organization does has to deal with agricultural, uh, specifically in mushroom farming, which we'll talk more about that later on. Um, Uganda has um, a, a massive population considering they're roughly the size of Oregon, which of course touched home for me being an Oregonian myself, um, since they are um, about that size, but they have far more people than we do in Oregon. Um, they have, or they're projected by the end of this year, by the end of 2020, to have 3.34% population growth with a total population of 43 million, which just boggles my mind considering their country is the size of my state, and we don't even have 4 million people in my state. So that fact really struck home to me. I can't imagine a population of nearly, what is that, like 10 times my state's population. I feel like Oregon's crowded already, so I couldn't imagine a 10 times more people in our state. Um, ongoing challenges in Uganda, of course, are explosive population growth. They have um, Tremendous increase, 3.34% is not only a huge increase, but considering that fact, coupled with the fact that they're one of the youngest nations in the world, with um, nearly half, 48.2% of their total population, is between the age of zero and 14. So um, that fact just like also totally blew my mind, and it makes me so proud to be part of this organization and the help that we're able to give a program like African Development Promise because this is really going to help strengthen their population going forward, hopefully being able to interest more women and girls into programs like this such as subsistence farming. Um, a couple of other challenges that the country has also include um, power and infrastructure constraints. They don't have a lot of really sound infrastructure. And then, of course, human rights deficits as well. Um, the average woman in Uganda has 5.8 children, um, and they typically have their first child um, before the age of 18. Um, another interesting fact I found out about Uganda is that uh, their primary civil en engineers and contractors are also women. They do most of the building uh, with the exception of the roof, which I don't know why I couldn't find any data on why they don't do the roofing side of it, but they do the primary um, building as well. So I thought that was an interesting fact about just some of the kinds of jobs that women are able to do uh, within that country. So uh, today our program is focusing on, as I had mentioned, African Development Promise or ADP. When we were going through and selecting this program, this totally struck a chord with us because it's the mushroom farmers, and we kept saying that over again and again. We've never funded a program before that is mushroom farming, and so that sparked our interest like out of the gate, and it quickly continued to be a fan favorite among our members on the GSC because of just the unique nature that mushroom farming has. Um, not only do I not even ever associate mushrooms with Uganda, but I don't know if I've ever even met a mushroom farmer anyway. So then to couple it with being in, you know, rural Uganda, it was just like, wait, what? what what's going on here? So um, I know we kind of talked about that as we were reviewing this particular application because it was just such a unique one. Uh, so this organization was founded in 2014 
and they asked us for a grant of $45,000 to be able to um, get this program up and running. So the title of this is actually phase two. We did not fund phase one, but the title of this is called phase two expansion, expansion of mushroom cultivation. Um, this organization is located in the Waikiso district uh, and that area partly includes the capital of Kampala um, in addition to uh, borders the, the north side of Lake Victoria, but the district is on the south side of Kampala. Um, one of the things about this program that I found really fascinating is that there was a study done um, by an outsourced organization through African Development Promise, and one of the components that they looked at about this program and why this program is so important to the area is the fact that they did a study on social return on investment. Now being a banker myself, return on investment is something that we talk about, but we don't ever talk about a social component to that. And what they found in this study is that $3.80 for, um, the return was $3.80 for every dollar invested in the program which is pretty substantial considering, I know these are menial numbers that we're talking about, but considering um, the fact that they were able to almost quadruple their return is um, pretty significant. Additionally, um, the women's wages on average being a part of this program increased 65% a month or $5.50 a day. And considering many of these marginalized women are living on $1.90 or less a day, to be able to go up to $5.50 a day is huge in their region. Um, it's also a known fact that women will typically re, uh, invest more into their communities. On average, it's about 90% of their income will be reinvested into their community um, and into their local economy. So the fact that they're able to do that with so much more money is going to be uh, such a huge impact for the region itself. So ADP really uh, lends itself to four key, uh, a four part strategy. And those four strategies that they are kind of their pillars are management training, which I'm sure you'll hear more about in their video, uh, technical assistance, giving the women the infrastructure to be able to uh, do their mushroom farming, um, network building, be able to figuring out who they can sell those mushrooms to, and then infrastructure solutions. Um, because this is all about mushroom cultivating, I also went down the path of, well, what, is it, what does it take to grow mushrooms? What does that mean? Um, and what I learned there is that there's really, there's about three main types of mushrooms that um, they're able to grow in Uganda, giving their climate and overall uh, what they have as resources there. Um, so they're able to use rain catchments to be able to collect the water and then mushrooms are grown in um, dark spaces. So um, they're able to set up, I'm, I don't know exactly, but I believe they're able to set up some kind of a lean-to or a shed of some sort and be able to grow their mushrooms in there. But part of the reasons why mushrooms are so successful in the region too is because they have a really short um, growing timeline uh, of fully developed mushrooms able to be harvested in about three to four weeks. So they're able to have really high turnover, which of course means more selling, which of course means more profit, and everything kind of be, works in a really positive relationship that way. So with that, Wendy, I'll go ahead and have you start the video and uh, we'll learn more about mushroom cultivation. Thank you so much, Celeste.
I am the founder and executive director of Africa Development Promise. The organization was founded in 2014, and that was as a result of my coming back to Uganda, a place where I grew up and lived for 15 years. The work that we've been doing has been mainly around supporting women's cooperatives. We started with a group called Epaphroditus Women's Cooperative. The cooperative started in 2012. That's when we decided to gather the women and got this idea of growing mushrooms. But when they first started, they were a small-scale operation selling mushrooms to church members and the local communities. But they soon recognized that there was a bigger market in and around Kampala. When Africa Development Promise identifies a cooperative, we go through a participatory process to identify what works and what hasn't worked. Using surveys and focus groups, we determine the stage of development. What we discovered with Epaphroditus was that the biggest expense was the mushroom garden. At the time we deal with mushrooms, we used to buy gardens from other farmers because we didn't know how to make it. So we partnered with National Agriculture Research Organization uh, to provide training to the women to make the mushroom gardens so that in this way the women would then have the skills to be able to make the mushroom gardens themselves and then in harvesting the mushrooms they would then be able to fetch a larger profit for the mushroom. Now the women had two streams of income. In addition to growing mushrooms for sale, they could also sell the mushroom gardens. With the profits and confidence that they had developed, they were ready to expand their business. With support from Africa Development Promise, we facilitated the construction of a larger, more modern growing facility. And to avoid post-harvest losses, we supported them with the solar dryer. In addition to infrastructure support, Africa Development Promise has trained the group on critical governance, leadership, and business management skills that allow them to successfully operate a viable business. As the cooperative becomes stronger, they have attracted and recruited an additional 10 members, thus better able to leverage their influence with the local community and public officials. In fact, Epaphroditus is proud that they have two members who ran for and were elected in the 2018 elections as the women representatives on the local council for their respective villages. Success builds success. The women have now branched out into piggery and they want to make sure that every member has a minimum of two pigs. Also, most recently, they have taken classes on how to attractively package, seal, and label their products so that they can sell easily. The next phase is to start and outgrow a scheme, also known as contract farming. The cooperative will recruit about 50 community women as contracted mushroom growers. This will allow the cooperative to boost its mushroom production while also allowing the outgrowers the opportunity to gain a sustained income. The outgrowers will be trained and given the tools needed to grow quality mushrooms. By including some of the village's poorest women, the cooperative will facilitate dramatic economic improvements, and the hope is that the increased income to outgrowers will encourage them to become cooperative members and enjoy its benefits, or possibly form their own cooperative. These women are mainly doing subsistence farming and don't have a means of income. With things moving to a market-based approach, it is important that women also be able to participate in this new economy and have their fair share of what they can make. We are very much appreciative to ADP just because they have brought us all that far from making losses 
to having bigger profits. Uh, thanks. If you have any uh, comments about the uh, video for Africa Development Pro um, Program, please, project, please uh, put it in the comments. We want to hear uh, more about that. And if you have any questions about the project that you want to ask Celeste or anyone else, uh, put them in the chat and Wendy will read off the uh, questions. Were there any questions that were added earlier? No. If you have any questions, please just add them in the chat. And Celeste, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Um, no, on this one, no. All right. How many women impacted by this grant, Celeste? I want to say that our in our draft on this one was going to be, oh, what was it? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, I think that our draft was we're going to have 60 new farmers, and I can't recall specifically about um, how many others were going to be joining the co-op in general, but our indirect was going to be, I'm going to say upwards of like 12 or 1300 total. But I'd have to look at that for sure to make sure that I'm not misquoting that information. Okay. Uh, thanks. And you I, I just pulled it up on, um, on our website, and if you go to our our, um, I put the link in there to go to all, so you can see all the educational materials. And in the project fact sheet, it says the project will directly impact 80 to 90 people. This includes the cooperatives, 29 members of which 27 are women and 50 to 60 outgrowers. Plus there would be at least 530 dependents who will be um, indirectly impacted. Um, and, and many others, um, such as suppliers, wholesalers, retailers, buyers. It, um, with our projects, you know, there are always, you know, as we say, when you support a woman, you're really, you know, that there's a ripple effect because then they support their families and communities. So there is always a huge um, indirect impact from these projects. There's a question. Um, from Alexandra, to whom do they market the dried mushrooms? So mushrooms in that region um, are one of their dietary staples because of their high nutritional value. So some of them are local growers, but as she had mentioned in that video, they are looking to be able to expand on their production and do some contracted work to be able to um, sell to bigger outfits as well, but that's still kind of a, something that will be following at that point in time. I don't believe that they have done that yet. So most of it is just local in local markets. Okay, and, and someone commented on that they um, do mushroom cultivation in Malawi as well, and she's wondering if this is something that's really popular in Africa. Um, I know that this particular program um, also has um, a component in Rwanda too. I don't know if they're actually growing mushrooms there or not, but um, I, I, they may just be testing it in Uganda to see how successful it is before taking it there, but I know that they have a presence in Rwanda as well. All right, uh, another question, how large is the market and would expanding them be growing too many mushrooms if they were to expand this project? So I, I don't know what the overall demand for, uh, for mushrooms is, but I, um, from what I have read and heard and learned with this particular organization is that um, they're unique because a lot of what we hear and see in growing is you know, coffee and soy and legumes and things of that nature are some of their highest exports of what uh, is done agriculturally. So I don't feel like there's going to be market saturation with them expanding their, 
their growing operation. I don't believe so. Uh, someone asked about the budget for the project, and I've, I'm sharing that um, with everyone right now. Um, it's always located in our project fact sheet. So you um, can take a look at that. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, I also want to ask you, Wendy, if you could bring up the shop, listen, um, watch, page to bring everyone's attention to that because oftentimes if you're not the presenter of the project um, you might not be be aware of all this information that we provide to all of our members every for every single month um, we provide a list of books uh, non-fiction and fiction about um, the country uh, films that are based in the country, uh, music from that country. And um, so I really encourage you to check these out. I have found some of my most favorite books from this list that we provide. And, and I think it's a great resource. Uh, also, please watch out for our Dining for Women book group, which we hope to be launching by the end of this month on Goodreads, or relaunching, really. Um, Number of comments about the, you know, sort of the health benefits of mushrooms. Um, in particular, they seem to have health benefits for HIV AIDS patients. Um, and I don't know if you know this, Celeste, or if it's in the materials, but any idea what type of mushrooms that they're growing? You know what, I don't recall them ever specifying what kind of mushrooms they're growing. And mm -hmm. I went back and read our original, their original application today and they did not specify that. Um, mm -hmm. I also looked on their website today too and I could not find anything about the type either. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Connie was mentioning, she said that she thought she saw something about oyster mushrooms, which, you know, uh, maybe, maybe that's Could possible. Be. Right. I think we've covered most of the questions um, we can all and we can certainly come back if you have more questions um, um, at the end um, but Celeste if you want to go on to our our month's sustained grantee sure yeah so our sustained grantee this month is the women's microfinance initiative um, they were a featured grantee in December of 2014 um, at that time, we had funded a project for them called Transitions to Independence. Uh, it was a grant for $45,000 and it was um, a village loan level uh, hubs were administer administered by local women. They were um, a, a lending organization. And uh, um, they are back now with an updated version of their um, microfinance initiative and uh, their new project that we are assisting them uh, by funding that funding for them is uh, titled Empowering Village Women Through Business Ownership. And this is again through microfinance and what we are um, helping them or allowing them to do with our grant is that for up to, I want to say it was 320 women were eligible um, for a two-year cycle of four six-month loans of up to $250. And these are uh, essentially startup loans to be able to get their businesses off the ground. Um, their businesses can include a variety of different uh, ventures. There's not something that, that they were being told that they had to um, start, but through their own entrepreneurship, they're able to start up these businesses. But um, these women are essentially the unbankable women. So they could not go to the bank and ask for a loan of any kind of amount. And so what the Women's Microfinance Initiative has done is that they essentially have kind of become the, the banking middleman, if you will, and uh, are able to work with these women on establishing their businesses and then being able to, um, you know, lend them this money to get their feet off the ground to be able to start their um, start their business and then um, through their profits then be able to pay them back and then at the end of that initial six months with their training and coaching and guidance then they're able to um, if they need additional funds to be able to 
either take their business to the next phase or move it on up or whatever the case may be, then they can come back again for um, up to four times in that two-year cycle. So let's go ahead and watch that video, Wendy. Every other Saturday, the headquarters of the Women's Microfinance Initiative in Biobo, Uganda, overflows with hundreds of world business women who have come to make their loan repayments and meet with their solidarity group members. The local coordinators track loan repayments and update the loan groups on their finances. Trainers provide ongoing lessons in business skills and financial literacy. The women themselves discuss their individual businesses and challenges and brainstorm solutions to problems like transporting goods during the rainy season when the road roads turn into rivers of mud. By encouraging one another and leaning in on each other for support, these rural women have successfully launched rural businesses with the resources provided by WMI. WMI was founded 10 years ago by seven businesswomen in the Washington, D.C. area. Their vision was a grassroots loan and business skills training program run by and for rural women in East Africa. For the past 10 years, the local program director, Olive Wulimbwa, has led this vision. Under her leadership, the program has grown from 20 loans totaling 2,000 U.S. dollars to over 45,000 loans totaling more than 6 million U.S. dollars. This expansion would not have been possible without the support of Dining for women. This loan program is critical to rural East African women as there are few jobs available to them in the formal economy. With little training, minimal access to transport, and their daily household duties, it is almost impossible to pursue formal employment. This means that self-employment is the only real chance for a rural woman to earn income to support herself and her family. WMI Loan Hubs are located in these villages where rural women live and work so that they can have easy access to WMI services. I am Olive Olibwa, the director of the loan program in the East Africa. The only program, people in this community were really suffering, especially women. Women used to suffer, you lack even what to feed, children own, children go to school barefooted, uh, having a meal, one meal in a day. Women, the dressing of women were really poor. So when the program came in, ladies came, got loans, they started the businesses, and now their families have changed. In fact, uh, you, you find a child very happy when he's going to school, breasted shoes, has school uniform, has books and pens, which was not the case before. Domestic violence in the families was really rampant. You find almost every home people are quarreling, people are fighting, women are divorcing, going to their homes, complaining on LOC courts, local courts in the village. You find there people every Sunday. But when the money program came in, women started doing businesses, women started contributing to family budget. Now domestic violence has reduced. Thank you, Dining for Women. It would not have been possible without your help. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dining for Women, for believing in the rural women of East Africa. What gifts can I give the praise donors?
Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I've been typing away. I hope you've been seeing what I've been writing in chat. Um, and uh, please, uh, I see Susan Negrin, one of our longtime members from Castro Valley, just type something in there as well about Uganda. This is a great way for us to see what everybody's working on. Um, are there any questions about the sustained project or um, um, the or, or that organization? Susan Negrin says she traveled to Uganda in 2010 and loved hearing about the programs. She had a lot of great memories with that visit to Uganda. Um, while I'm waiting for questions here, I just want to bring your attention to our new advocacy chapter, which launched this year. Uh, it's called the DFW Advocacy Chapter with Results. And it's called Results for two reasons. One is we're partnering with a national organization called Results that focus it, that is an excellent uh, advocate trainer for grassroots advocates and, and uh, people are really enjoying it and they will help each person in this uh, chapter to become advocates in their area for specific things like um, global maternal health and um, so uh, yes and Connie says she loved reading about the two women featured in the DFW information. She encourages everyone to check it out. Uh, if you're a person who hasn't normally gone to our website because you um, have a wonderful program presenter and chapter leader, I really encourage you to go to our materials for the each grantee because we we give you so much information that most chapters don't present everything and so there's a lot more there uh different chapters present different things and so uh, i encourage you to check out everything that is on each project uh page um Yes, and last Saturday, uh, Vicki, thanks for reminding me, there was a great session with Dining for Women and Nicholas Kristoff. Um, actually, sorry, it was with results, um, but many Dining for Women members were on there, and um, uh, Nicholas Kristoff uh, did a great talk on the effects, the effects of coronavirus on poverty. Um, and also, one other thing that I want to remind you is that even if you're not meeting with your chapter, many chapters are meeting on Zoom. Even if you're not meeting with your chapter, we hope that this, um, you remember that this month is Chapter Leader Appreciation Month and uh, to send your chapter leader a card to thank them or just drop them an email to thank them for all they've done for Dining for Women. Um, any questions about the about the sustained grantee or about sustained grantees in general? Okay. Um, all right. We are going to uh, Celeste. Do you want to add anything else about the sustained grantee? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Does anyone know um, the effects of coronavirus in Uganda? Um, what I know that is happening um, uh, in, actually, yes, this was in Uganda. I talked to another organization yesterday and I was trying to remember which country they were in that we were discussing. Um, in Uganda, they are, uh, Schools um, have been closed. They are encouraging people to shelter at home. Um, but of course, people who are not in a lot of the kinds of programs that we support really don't have the, the um, wherewithal to sustain um, 
themselves through a crisis like this. Uh, what I heard from this one particular project that, it, and it was a project that we, we um, uh, haven't funded, but they were saying that they, within their project, the women who have participated in their programs have been able to sustain themselves much better. And I believe that to be true uh, for any of the projects that we support. And we will be getting more and more cases, you know, hearing more information about what's happening in other countries. Um, we have been posting a lot of information on our Facebook page about the, um, the extent, you know, poverty will be, um, uh, 100, 100 to 140 million people are being pushed back into extreme poverty. Um, uh, right, Susan Negrin, the, the, the ability to socially isolate is really a, a, a position of privilege. And so many of the situations that our grantees and people are in, particularly in slums, don't have the opportunity to socially isolate. Um, and uh, so someone just posted here that um, there are 53 cases in Uganda, no deaths yet. And I, one of the things that we know to be true, we, we, we feel that this will be a, a inevitable outcome is that gender equality is going to be set back years. Uh, through coronavirus and organizations like Dining for Women will be more needed than ever. Uh, the gender-based violence and domestic violence that is happening all over the place is increasing. This is increasing here. It's increasing in other countries. And I think that this really demonstrates how our futures are bound together with other women across the world. We we can't uh, isolate ourselves from this and neither can they. And we can see what's happening to us is what's happening to other places in the world. And I think that if there's any understanding that can come out of this is there's, I hope that there will be a higher level of empathy um, between ac across borders because we can see what happens with that, that we're, none of us are immune and we're all in this together. So um, uh, someone just posted something here. Oh, Chris King posted the link to the results meeting with Nick, Nicholas Kristoff. I really do encourage you to watch that. Um, Mary Ann just posted that Kenya has 50 million people and 144 ICU beds. Um, also, uh, Celeste mentioned that the locusts are taking over East Africa um, and people are fighting that. And uh, also people who are fighting that are also trying to stop a, a major food crop shortage so they're not socially distancing themselves. I mean, this is because uh, Africa has been um, a little later in countries in Africa are be seeing the brunt of coronavirus a little later than um, some of the uh, European, China, um, and uh, um, North American countries. I think that we haven't truly seen or even can comprehend the disaster that's about to happen there. So any other questions or comments? I'd love to hear from someone. Unmute yourself, please, and <laughs> someone ask a question. <laughs> I just have a comment about um, the testing. You wonder how much testing they're able to do in those countries because the numbers may be low, but it may be because they're not being tested. That's right. That's, that's definitely true. It's, yeah. Any other comments or insight that anyone wants to add to 
this discussion? Okay, while you are considering that, uh, we're going to try something new. We're going to do a really basic poll, and at the bottom of your tools here, you'll see a poll. And the poll just uh, popped up in my window. Hopefully it popped up in yours as well. And we are trying to determine, now that most people are sheltering at home, um, what time would be preferred for a Pacific time chapter meetings. The staff, Wendy and I, are here in South Carolina. So for us, this the West Coast ones have been ending at 11.30 at night. And we would love to make it a little bit um earlier if that's possible so even 6 p.m pacific would make a huge difference um it might also make a difference so that if people from the east coast want to join in on a west coast one and it's not so late for them as well um you guys are participating in this it's so exciting only 15 people though so far oh wow it's going up it's about it, even and if even. It doesn't, if it doesn't matter, should we still pick one? Sure. If you're an East Coast person yeah. and you're on here at 10 o'clock at night and you think that you might um, participate in a West Coast one in the future and you want to vote, please vote. Sorry, but I don't see where to vote. Where is the poll? Um, go... Wendy, can you share with them where to vote? Um, my my screen because I'm the host. I just see the 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 poll. I I so how did you see see it? I'm the same. I'm not seeing um, where to vote. It just popped up. It came up. The window. But if you're not like on a computer, then it should be like, it should have come up like as a minimized window was what it should have done. So if you click down on the bottom, it, it should, it should have appeared for you, um, like as another screen. It did that for me in Boulder. Okay. Tablet? Yes. Yeah, that's what I should have done. Well, this is really neat. If there are, other, this is the first time we've tried a poll. This is pretty straightforward, easy poll. We didn't want to put anything too complicated in there yet. But if you have ideas for future polls, uh, please make a suggestion to us. And um, it is about five till eight Pacific time. And I would like to um, thank Celeste so much for presenting tonight. And um, Celeste will be staying on for the next half hour or so to answer any questions about the Grant Selection Committee. Also, I want to thank Wendy Fratelin for running everything behind the scenes. And I wanna thank all of you for being here. So if you have questions, let's just open it up. If you want to say hi to someone, um, this is sort of our, our official meeting. If you have to run to your next Zoom meeting, we encourage you to do so. Otherwise, you can stay on with us and chat with your friends and um, ask some questions. So Celeste, while people um, might be writing their questions in the Zoom uh, chat, why don't you uh, tell us sort of the process of selecting grants? Yes, certainly. Um, it's a big process, <laughs> but it's awesome. So we have the grant selection committee. Um, and then we have Vina kind of as our director, and then uh, we have Lynn Broadbent, who is our, I don't know what her official title is, but she also helps lead our meetings as well. 
Um, and it's a cyclical process. So we start out, um, when we'll be meeting again. So we'll start meeting in May to review the LOIs. And those are the letters of intent. They are about a seven, eight page um, interest letter that kind of gives us a little bit of feedback about who the organization is, uh, where are they located, um, what kind of a project would we be interested in? Uh, or are they, you know, coming to us for potential funding on? Um, kind of gives us some rough numbers of about um, direct and indirect um, impacted people, but it's really high level for the most part. Um, and we, uh, Vina has a group that kind of does some real high levels pre-screening of those and then they're divided up between our two teams. We have two teams, um, five and five, and they're divided, uh, those LOIs, the letters of intent, are divided up between our two teams. And we're expected to read mm, in the, about 35 is what it ends up being, give or take a cycle. Um, we are assigned a couple, maybe I, I might be assigned, I don't know, five or six or seven, kind of depending on how many we get in each cycle that I have to read and review and then present to our group. And it's like that for all of us. And then um, at the end of our weekly meeting, so we'll meet probably about four or five weeks, again, kind of depending on exactly how many letters of intent we receive, exactly how many we're able to accomplish in a week, which we try to target about four to five in a week. Um, then we go through and we score them. We have a very detailed scoring process that we uh, go through and we score all of them. Um, and it's all uniform. So we're all using the exact same letters of intent that we're reading and we're reviewing using the exact same scoring process. Um, so everything is apples to apples there. And then we narrow that down from 35 what times two potentially so I mean, we narrow that down from a huge number anywhere 50 70 who knows exactly how many um we narrow that down to 16 and we have to cut a lot some were able to cut the day that we meet we're able to cut them because they don't meet one of the criteria some we're able to cut because it's just um, a program that is the way that it's written just may not be suitable for what we're looking for. It may not have enough substance in it, even though it is just kind of an interest letter, it still may not have enough substance in it for us to be able to really like believe that our members would have an interest in the program. Um, and so then we narrow it down to the pool of 16 and then we merge our two groups together and uh, um, this becomes a full app stage. So we take a month off and Vina or roughly a month, you know, we'll go back and um, contact all of those that we have interest in and ask them to submit a full application, which is a, a much more detailed process. Um, the application goes from about six or seven pages to 21 pages. Um, and 2021, I think we have a clause on there that says it shouldn't exceed 20, but that sometimes is not always the case. <laughs> it tends to run over just a little bit. Um, and then uh, say a similar process occurs where we're each assigned uh, a number of full applications for us to essentially become the owners of. And it's again our responsibility to go through and review the entire, um, the entire application, which also includes some um, additional pieces of information as well, their financials and their budget and their tax documentation. They also then have to submit um, they have to get letters of recommendation that we have to review. We have to know who's on their board. We have to know who their top five funders are. We look at all of this. Literally, we are dissecting and going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole about who is this and how do they relate and is there any bad press on them or good press on them or positives or negatives or anything. Um, so that is a very lengthy process. It takes, um, it takes several hours for each full application to go through and really do all of those deep dives and review. Uh, then we'll meet once a week again and uh, present um, again about, we try to get through about four, sometimes we push it to five. We're not very good about doing five though because then our meetings won't run quite long because we're wordy and we do a lot of research and we want to make sure that we're 
explaining the full picture to all of the other members on our team. Um, and then again, we go through a, another process of scoring each of the um, programs we have left at the full lap stage, unless we find something that is just like, we can't do it no matter what, because according to the guidelines, we cannot do it. We typically don't throw anything out at the full lap stage. Um, so then we'll take all 16 of those, we'll score all 16 of those, and uh, then uh, in the past we have met in uh, South Carolina and done our face-to-face -face meeting at that point. So all 12 of us on our, on our actual committee, plus um, Beth Ellen normally is there and other people have come in and out over the time being, uh, we all basically sit, we go over them again, a higher level view at that point because we know them quite well at that time. Um, and then we, we go through them relatively quickly one more time. And then literally we just start writing them down on big, huge, giant post-it notes and start talking about them. And there typically is somebody on the, uh, on the committee that instantly is like, nope, let's ask them, we've got better ones. And there typically is somebody that's like, but I love this project and we can't let it go. And so then we have to start a very, very detailed discussion of what, what do we do? Do we keep it? Do we not? Do we, sometimes we have to parking lot them on the side because we just get emotional about them and we're unable to make a, a sound decision at that time. So we got to put it over to the side and come back to it. Um, sometimes it's a quick yes, sometimes it's a long yes, and sometimes it goes that way with no's too. It can be a quick no or it can be a long no. Um, but we all have to come to a consensus on it. So it really is a true negotiation of who, who's going to do what, who's going to eventually say, okay, I agree um, that this may not be the best one or this is the best one or whatever the case may be. But ultimately we all are able to make our decision um, and leave, uh, most of us leave with at least the, the top couple of ours um, that we all kind of had similar interests on uh, raising relatively high in the rankings that were able to at least fund those. Um, every project that we fund ends up being a fantastic project. I'm really excited about the next ones that are coming up um, for the second half of this year too because we have some really fun ones coming down the pike. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how the process is. It is, uh, it is very time consuming because we do so much research on all of the projects, but um, it's really re rewarding as well because we are able to, we're able to learn so much and we really have a great group on the committee right now. We work really nicely together for the most part. So it's a pleasure. Thank you, Celeste. Does anyone have any questions for her? It is a very lengthy process and we get about 100 applicants or more for six spots. And so we have to eliminate 94% of applicants, uh, which is really hard because so many of our applicants are so deserving. And um, one of the ways that Dining for, that we distinguish ourselves as a grant maker is that our staff will work extensively um, with grantees after they've applied once and have been turned down uh, to help them, if they are a good match otherwise, to help them get their application uh, framed in a way or improved so that they might have a chance another time. We have had many uh, grantees over the years who have applied two, three, four times before they are actually uh, accepted. That happened in this last grant cycle. I can't remember who it was exactly, but it was so thrilling to see them. You know, they had been talked about for numerous cycles and, and finally they, they made it through. So that was really thrilling. He is actually one, um, ADP came to us as an LOI and uh, we did not invite them to submit a full app and then they came back and now we're funding them. So I, I know because I had that one at the letter of intent stage and we did not push it forward. So no, that's a prime example of exactly what happens and it comes back as a success. And, 
uh, yes. So, so if a, a if a, an applicant is not selected, they can. Um, they are absolutely welcome to apply again. It's such an extensive process that um, um, it's hard to go through it once and and not have made it and and not want to at least try again. If especially if your organization has made it to the final fifteen. Um, I think um, the other part about uh, applying again is that our uh, staff will work work with um, organizations to make sure that um, they have the feedback they need on their applications so that they might have a better chance in the next time. Um, someone asked about countries and, you know, sometimes um, the first thing, we aim to find the very best projects with the um, deepest and um, impact that, that we can find. Sometimes that means that, especially um, I think a couple of years ago, we had like three Kenya projects or something in, in one six month period. And, and in the past, I know in years before that, that was not something we did. And um, we've changed that a little bit so that um, we can pick the very best projects and our project selection is not solely uh, made based on the needs of members. And that's really important, but we always want to try to center our grants around the needs of the women and girls first. And so we also try to, um, we also want geographic diversity and project diversity because we want to educate our members of the, the breadth of issues that women and girls are facing in the various geographies. And so it's a very tough balance, um, but I think that we, we, we do that pretty well. The other consideration is that because we don't target our applications, we don't know who is going to apply. Um, who knows, maybe one year we'll have 75% of our applicants come from Peru, you know, that would be a challenge for us at that time to get um, um, geographic diversity. But, um, but we certainly would not be weeding out projects just because all the um, best ones are in the same country. So just to give that as an example. I also wanted to add, there was one of the questions on here that was talking about what feedback is sent to uh, an organization that does not receive a grant. So one of the things that um, the members of the GSC are responsible for doing at both the letter of intent stage and at the full app stage, we are required to include extensive uh, notes on a tracking sheet so that especially as the owner of an LOI or the owner of a full app, we're expected to know that organization better than any other member on our team because we're the ones that ultimately be presenting it to our committee. And uh, we have to complete the tracking sheet and include notes so that in the event they're not selected and Bina does have to relay that information back to them, she has that uh, basis as to what happened, why were they not able to be selected, is it something that they potentially can overcome in the future or is it just something that it's too big to overcome because it doesn't meet one of our rules or guidelines, for example. So um, we definitely do have um, a very thorough tracking process so that there is um, notes in there. And it also really helps us too, because as Beth Ellen mentioned, we oftentimes will see you know, maybe a handful of repeat applications. And then we are able to go back and look at those tracking notes too to see, are they resubmitting the same program or are they resubmitting it for um, a, a brand new program so that we at least have a little bit of background information about the organization and what their, um, what their intent is um, to it kind of helps us because we may look at it in a different light if it's coming back the exact same program and it literally is like a copy paste like they're trying to get it in again without making any kind of 
improvements or amendments or changes to it? Or are they now submitting it as a brand new program and then we can kind of look at it with a fresh set of eyes? Um, and we definitely have seen over time where we've seen repeat applications come back and they really have improved and expanded on what their ultimate goal is. And so we're able to, you know, we're able to look at it that much better and that much stronger so that we were able to potentially fund it the next time around too. That happens quite a bit. Thanks, Celeste. Uh, Vicki Bush Joseph uh, uh, asked, how do we choose committee members? About once every two years, we solicit applications and the applications are about as, or the, the application process is like going through um, a job interview. Um, <laughs> there are multiple interviews. There is a, a, a letter of intent resume that the entire committee looks at and votes on. Um, there is, um, um, a, a, and, and one of the things that we try to do with the committees is that we have team one, team two, and team three. Uh, so Celeste right now is on team one, and that means they're the active team. It's 10 people. Oh, you're on team two? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so um, people from team two will move up into um, the active spots as people retire. Um, and so that way we never have a full turnover of a team all at once and the new people can educate, I mean the um, experienced people can educate the, the new people and uh, then we also have a team three and team three is in training and then they will move up um, as well. And so um, generally we're maintaining and managing about 30 volunteers through the process. And then we also have our past volunteers and those past GSC members will um, do projects for us and research that sometimes you'll see reports on in the dish or um, sometimes it makes it into the annual report or things like that. Um, and some of this is, you know, to see where grantees are now, to see what grantees still exist uh, from 10 or 15 years ago. All of that uh, type of research is done by very experienced grant selection committee volunteers. And I want to tell you that the grant selection committee, the, the members on the committee are so <laughs> impressive and knowledgeable about the issues the um, the countries we have so many people from um, the State Department um, who have nonprofit experience, who have grant making experience, um, who have extensive dining for women experience. So um, it, it's not to say that you have to be from the State Department to get on the GSC because that's not the case, but it is. Um, uh, having extensive international experience, at least traveling internationally, that's always really helpful. Um, and being a, a, an engaged Dining for Women member is, is also helpful as well. Do we have any other grant selection team members on right now? No, I don't think so. Any other questions about this process or um, dining for women in general? I, um, while we're sitting, it, it, just speak up if you want to unmute yourself and just speak up because I'm just going to kind of um, keep talking. I want to point out a couple of really cool people we have on here. Uh, Donna Neshek is a Oh, she unmuted herself too. She's a regional <laughs> leader. So what do you want to share, Donna? Oh, I was just, well, I'm a terrible typist, so I didn't get my message in. But when Alexander talked about chapter meetings or during the coronavirus issue right now, something that I'm going to do when I send a note out to my chapter members, I just want to have a Zoom meeting that isn't even going to focus on the grantee per se, but just a checking in, let everybody see each other's faces because I'm feeling that because of lack of seeing people, 
I don't know if, you know, the internet communication, the dish, all that stuff is really connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm going to be this month, as soon as I figure out Zoom well, I'm hoping to just have a, hi, I haven't seen you guys. How are you doing? And then at the very end, maybe a gentle reminder that um, one thing I guess that impressed me the most was my daughter was talking to a friend in Australia and I just make it really short, but she was talking to a friend in Australia who happened to mention how his life, because he's been home, he realizes that he's actually saving some money. <laughs> and he thought it was an interesting dynamic that's going on. He's got three young children, you know, he's a worker, he's doing all these things. And so one of the things I wrote in my note was what my daughter had shared. Wow, I'm actually saving something. So maybe while we're all staying home, cooking, engaging with our families, we might be able to pay forward a little bit more. So I'm trying to do almost a backdoor chapter meeting to say hi to my chapter members. Remember us, we missed you, I miss you, I'd like to see you. And by the way, so I was gonna write that to Alexandra, but I couldn't type it and then I thought it was way late. So that was my, that's my message to my, what I'm planning on doing for just a creative chapter meeting not even bringing up, not showing the video for the grantee, anything like that, just hi. And then maybe at the end say, by the way, please check out the video. Think about what you've saved and what your life has been like this month and how to pay it forward. So that was what I thank wanted you. to say. And thank, thank you, you to you guys. Okay. Yeah, I, I, thank you for doing that. I think the other part is that Dining for Women really is a community and when we don't see each other um, and, and some, some people are not going to be the people to reach out, but when one person does, don't you appreciate it when someone reaches out to you and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had reached out to you. Mm -hmm. Well, we can do that for each other as Dining for Women members. And we have a community and it's so wonderful to see so many people on here but we do need to check in on each other just to make sure everybody's okay and to see if anybody needs anything. Yes, so the other person I wanted to point out is Chris King. Um, she is on our advocacy committee um, and has been there for a long time. She is a chapter leader in San Francisco. Chris, do you wanna talk about advocacy? Um. I don't really want to talk a lot right now. I oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot about your voice. I'm sorry. Yeah, but she's okay. the one who who posted the uh, link to the Nick, Nicholas Kristoff uh, talk, which I really encourage you to watch. It's really great, and um, and and to check out our advocacy chapter next Wednesday night because it's a it's a lot of fun, and it's another way to meet. Dining for Women members from across the country like this. So it's so fun. Any other questions or comments? Vicki, you're unmuted. Did you have something? I was just going to type thanks again. It's just wonderful to be with like-minded women all over the world, all over the country. So um, great to see everybody. And uh, uh, Donna, I love your idea. Part of the challenge with some of our older friends and members, though, is is getting them to understand Zoom. So the more information that you can send out about how to use it, and um, I've I've gotten some of those. I, I can forward one to you, Donna, um, that might be helpful. But um, one of my book groups is led by an 89-year-old woman who is all over it, and uh, we're gonna. She's gonna actually. Um, Post a Zoom meeting, so uh, it, it's 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 possible, but it can be a little challenging. There is a Zoom bingo card, you know. <laughs> how, can you all mute yourselves? How do I unmute myself? I, it's it's kind of funny. <laughs> Thank well, you, Vicky. Vicky, Vicky um, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, um, we are we are certainly learning a lot about this and tonight was another learning experience so I have a question for you all that were able to get on the call I got um, messages from from some people who could not join the meeting oh. I'm suspecting it has something to do with one security setting that we um, that we set when we when we created the meeting 
a number of people were being asked for an email and a password. And um, like Celeste, like what you said earlier that you had to actually set up a Zoom account. Did any of you have that experience? And if, if you didn't, if you did not have to do it, did you already have a Zoom account? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, so Chris said just, you had to log into your personal Zoom account. Yeah, I just pushed the button um, on Wendy's email, but I think I, I must have a Zoom account. So that made it, you know, I just, I just pushed the button. So I'm assuming I have a Zoom account. The good news so, is that I know exactly the setting that it is, um, which it was so funny. Beth Allen and I, after last week, we were going through all the, the settings on Zoom, read all the articles, did all the research, talked to a cybersecurity expert. <laughs> and um, we were just, you know, really trying to be very cautious and, and clicked off anything that to us could prevent a Zoom bomber from coming in. But it's that one, Beth Ellen, um, about allowing only authenticated users. And I think what they mean by an authenticated user is someone that ha already has a Zoom account. So next week, we'll know, just not, we won't sh check that off. And I'm gonna follow up with anyone who couldn't get on and make sure they have the recording and, and the invitation to join next week, so. Also, um, I wanted just one more thing and then I'm gonna let everybody go. Um, one thing that has been suggested and I just wanna get your take on it, especially because of Vicki's comment about um, people not knowing how to do Zoom and, and, and people being nervous about it. Um, it. One suggestion was that we have a, 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 a Zoom happy hour where people where we're just sort of on there and um, people can register for it and just to practice. And the whole purpose is just teach people how to mute and unmute, teach <laughs> problem solve with them on that. Um, do you think that that would be useful? I think that's great. So I've okay. done a lot of Zoom because um, I used it for my work. I recently retired, but I had to link it to my personal email, not to my, um, old work email, but my, my clan has taken this on as a way of staying connected as well. So uh, it's, it's a great tool, but it does have bumps in the road. And I just want to reiterate, one of the reasons that I'm going to do the Zoom meeting the way I was thinking of doing it is just to say, hey, this is how you use Zoom, guys. So it, let's just, everybody make sure that we all have, you know, some, just figure it out. And this is the best way to, it, teach people how to use it without having to feel like, oh, we're at a meeting or there's some goal to it. The goal is how the heck do you use Zoom and can we get on? So that that yeah. is a little bit of the back of what I'm hoping to do when I, when I, when I figure out how to get people. No, I mean, that's a great oh. idea. Of course, you know, the challenge is that we got to get people on first. <laughs> Before yeah, that's we exactly teach it. Them. Yeah. So, I know it's going to be a challenge. I'm going to see how techy my, my, my chapter is. I'm hoping they either have a, yeah, I have a spiritual leader at home because my daughter's living with me. So I, I'm Now, I did, however, see, um, as I'm going through all these many settings that you can, that you can do, um, there was one that said something about being able to provide online support. So I'd like to test that out sometime and, um, and see whether that means like you can actually, I don't know what, I don't know what it would do, but, but um, I didn't check it off this time, but uh, maybe, maybe that's something worth looking into too. So I, I'm happy to share with anyone the things I've learned, but I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not perfect at it yet, but learning as I go. Well, thank you, everyone. Yes, Judy. Uh, we had our Zoom meeting last night, and it was we spent a lot of time getting those people who were challenged by getting online. My son is a software engineer, and so he helped people, and I did my best, and we did get people online. I mentioned before the meeting last week, the attempted meeting last week, that um, in our group, we ask a question each time. The question that was the first one that our chapter leader posed 
just as the group was, she said women often are um, reluctant to toot their own horn. And she just wanted people to feel comfortable telling one another what they're proud of. And we went around the table and each nice. person talked about something different that made them proud and we got to know one another. That was the first question. I, the, I remember our January meeting, the question was, what are you going to do to make a life better this year mm -hmm. or the world better this year? And for some people, it was a very personal answer. Some people said things like, I'm going to try to listen to people when they talk instead of sitting awaiting to say what I'm thinking of saying, saying and jumping in afterward, I'm going to try to really listen. Whereas other people talked about their volunteer work that they were doing. And last night we, we went around and for the first hour of the meeting, we just spent uh, uh, each with the question, how are you doing in this time of social distancing? How is it affecting you and your family? Do you have anything that you're concerned about? Is there any way that we can help? And what gives you hope and, and is some kind of brightness in your life? And you can answer any part of that or the whole thing. We gave each person, there were probably uh, 16 or 18 women on the call, and I figured it out ahead of time and said we could each have five minutes. I had a little thing where I put out a flower for each minute, a paper flower, so they would know how many minutes they had. And one time, luckily, I had like four extra flowers because people would keep talking, but most of them only used a couple minutes to just share. And then we talked afterward. But it has made us all just more comfortable uh, with each other to really know the kinds of things that are going on in each other's lives to really know that one woman has a son in Somalia right now and another has has a son in in another hot spot in the world and they were concerned about them so we had a chance to share and know what's going on with each other's lives and after all that, then we watched the video and I gave a presentation on the, on, on the organization that was the organization of the month. But we had a wonderful meeting. It was great. Nice. Getting on Zoom was not great. <laughs> it was a pain in the rear. And for people who are using Macintosh, one of the things that you have to do is you have to go over to the preferences and you have to um, go into privacy and security and you have to click on the camera and uh, unclick it to open up your lock and select that Zoom is allowed to use your camera. And then you have to get out of Zoom, uh, quit out of Zoom and get back into Zoom for that to actually work. It's like a big friggin' deal. It's not straightforward, but anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I think that that's a great idea. And I do now, now I remember you suggesting that. Um, I, I would say that we, um, after last week, I wasn't really remembering um, a lot <laughs> of good things from that meeting, unfortunately. That so so um, that's something I think that we can incorporate as part of the introduction is put, you know, send out in the email, Wendy, ahead of time. <clears throat> think, you know, this is the question of the night and people can type it in the chat. We don't really have time to um, have everyone go around, but it is 8.30 Pacific and we wanna wrap it up, but thank you so much for being here. I love seeing everybody every week. I think Donna and Vicki have been on every single one of them and I love seeing you. I think Gail and Chris too. <laughs> yeah, and Gail and Chris, yeah. It's, awesome it's just so much fun all right feel better chris okay all right thank you everyone Stay bye. Stay healthy be strong thank you good night bye. good night